Hi, this is your Sapil Bharti and we are here at Open Source Summit in Vancouver. And today we have with us Amanda Brock, CEO and founder of Open UK. Amanda, it's great to have you on the show. Thank you very much for having me along. Yeah, I would of course love to talk about Open UK, what it is, uh, and of course your own open source journey, why you started. So let's start with Open UK, what it okay. is. So Open UK is an unusual organization. We are the industry organization for open technology for the UK. And that's open source software, open hardware, and open data. Now, we sort of broke the mold in that we focus on people. Um, we are about the business of open technology, but we focus on individuals in our geographic location. We don't care if they work for UK companies, international companies, homegrown companies, you know, it doesn't really matter. We focus on the individual and the fact that they're in the UK, whoever they work for. And the companies follow along behind. And what that's meant is that we've brought together the most incredible group of people who are leadership across the UK in open technology. It's just been a phenomenal experience. And we, we operate on three pillars. So community, that leadership community I've just talked to you about, legal and policy, taking their voice, their collective voice, and having impact on laws and policies in the UK, and then learning, building the skills for the future. You talked about, you know, the, first of all, hardware, software, and other thing, yeah. but you said your focus is more on people. Absolutely. So so what I want to talk about, because when we look at, you know, any technology, yeah. or if you talk about open source in general, mostly, you know, you have geeks who, who love to talk about code. Yeah. But... Uh, the fact is that open source is actually less about code, it's about collaboration. Absolutely. And sometimes, you know, if you look at people who have created mm -hmm. projects, they may not be very good communicator, you know. They are like introverts, they just created code, but yeah. th their projects are being used by millions of users. So I want to talk to you about the, the people or human aspect of sure. code and open source. What was, you know, what kind of initiated that, hey, let's put focus on people? Mm -hmm. First of all, my background is that I'm a lawyer, right? I was a lawyer for 25 years. I haven't been a lawyer for the last five, and I've been working for Open UK for most of those. So for me, tech was about IP and relationships, about individuals and their relationships with each other. So if you create a piece of code and nobody comes along and uses that code, there's not much point, right? And we see, particularly as we watch things like government start to use open source software, their initial policy is always to save costs. Without exception, they want to avoid lock-in, they want to create code that's recycled and reused. The problem is that if you simply create code and put it on GitHub, nobody's ever gonna come along and use it, right? So you have to be able to communicate to others. You have to build a community around it. You have to have collaboration, contributions, and then all sorts of things that you might not get from a software engineer, like documentation, like training, like skills development that happens when other people come into your community. So we see this whole ecosystem of people around the code. And for me, they are, more important because they're what creates the code. The code does not dictate them, it's the other way around for me. So that's really where we came from. Right, one more aspect of open source is, is not, uh, in addition to uh, people aspect is also, it has to be sustainable as well. Absolutely. If just one person writing the code in yeah. a free time, or if a con company contribute or donate a code or a yeah. charity, it's not going to be sustainable. So how do you also ensure that, you know, you know, the folks are not, you know, doing charity as I'm contributing to open source, but it's like tied to their own. Because today, even if you look at Linux Foundation reports, yeah. a lot of developers today are on the payroll of big companies. Yeah, it's are. not, you know, yeah. they, they moonlight as a developer at night and do something else today. So talk about the sustainability point. That's an interesting question, right? So the, there is some pushback on that. So we don't currently demonstrate well whether individuals are contributing as part of their company role or in their own time as their themselves uh, off their own back. So I, I've mentioned that I was a lawyer. I worked for a company called Canonical for five years and I set up the legal team there. One of the things we did was look at our employment contracts to give people the ability to contribute in their own time. And that's something even today, 15 years later, that companies are often still working on is to allow their employees to do their own thing. And you have to think, how do you differentiate what that individual is doing in the course of their work and what are they doing off their own back, right? So we used to work on the basis that if your manager had asked you to do something, you were doing it for the company. And if you were just going and, you know, tinkering with a project or making your own contributions, that was your thing. And that differentiation is hard to make and we don't have good statistics around it. 
So when we look at GitHub, we can't really analyze when people contribute, which basis they're doing it on. And Open UK does a lot of uh, re research and reporting. We are about to do our next uh, survey uh, starts next Tuesday, which I think is the 16th, 17th. Uh, of May, and then we will do reporting around that. And we focus a lot on the economics and understanding these things. But as we go year on year, we get further into some of these questions and understanding more about why the developers contribute, when they contribute. So Jim was talking this morning in his keynote about the fact that we see open source increase when there's a recession. But somebody else was pointing out to me that's because a lot of the developers who are unemployed have time to make contributions. So we don't track whether they're doing it, you know, in the course of their work. Are you actively employed at the moment? I absolutely agree with you, however, though. Most of the developers we've seen contribute, their contributions effectively become their CV. And they've become people who are highly employable and in the last decade really sought after. And it's, there's probably no better way to show an employer your skills as an engineer than to be doing open source. And since you mentioned canonical, if you look at, remember the early days of canonical, canonical kind of uh, created a kind of, you know, a whole business for all the Debian, De Debian developers. You know, they, most of them become Ubuntu developers, most of them became yeah. canonical employees. Yeah. So, so that, you know, a lot of Debian, Debian developers, you know, mm -hmm. that's, so, and, you know, a lot of these open source companies. So that's what I was talking about. Sustain for the sustainability, sustainability is very important. Is. Also, I think that as we move further further in our lives, when we are college students, we have a lot of free time, when we get married, then we have kids, and then you have to bills to pay, and then yeah. you have less time. So um, even today, when we look at the whole cloud native landscape, mm -hmm. right, a lot of folks, they are on the company, and whatever the work, work they're doing yeah. is, you know, so Shipping yes, companies. but the challenge is that yeah. uh, it becomes hard to track, Mm -hmm. And the whole model of open source is also not much about tracking. People use different handles. No, it's interesting. Yeah, so it, it's one of the things you may have noticed with Ubuntu, and this was a conscious decision that we didn't, at least then, uh, ever have anybody register to use it. So yeah. we couldn't prove how many users we had, which we needed in certain circumstances, because it was antithetical. It was against the grain of what we, we did. Now our developers had come out of the Debian movement. You know, Ubuntu was based on that. So it was really important to them. And I think that um, that point that you make, though, about the shift. So 15 years ago, a lot of people contributing were doing it in their own time, and they were in roles where their day job was proprietary engineering. And in the last five, 10 years, that shifted. So, you know, developers who have cut their teeth on open source, who demonstrate a good history in that space, and have these very cutting edge innovative skills, particularly today with things like languages like our Rust, you know, and when we start to see things like memory safety being talked about by the White House, then you're starting to see an open source language that is low in terms of its energy consumption, which is more secure in terms of memory safety than a lot of things that we're looking at. So, you know, you are really seeing open source come to the fore. And therefore, you are seeing more and more people who started life contributing, maybe when they're in high school, maybe as a hobbyist but those people now working in it. I want to talk about, you know, you earlier mentioned about government. When we look at Europe, you know, I'm looking at Europe in general, you know, and yeah. not, you know, political, no, but uh, open source Linux kernel, it came from Europe, you know, and there is a big, huge community of yeah. kernel developers in Europe, a lot of projects. Yeah. Culturally, Europe is uh, totally different than the US, you know, Sorry. a lot of get, folks get involved there. A lot of contribution comes out, a lot of adoption. If you look at the whole Munich, you know, project yeah. with, the, with the, you know, Linux adoption there, uh, so a lot of you know grass level movement, grass yeah. level movement is there, yeah, but there we is. don't see a lot of companies coming and releasing their open well, source that's code. Super interesting. So what I want to understand from you when you look at the European space, yeah. when you look at a lot of government policies which are like, yeah. but sometimes the policies are like not very well. So the thing is, the lawmakers mm -hmm. they may want open source, but they don't yeah. understand open source. So what kind of challenges you see in yeah. Europe when it comes to talking with the government entities? to embrace okay. open source in the right manner. You've talked about two different things. So there is the piece around scale-ups, right? And I can't really speak for the rest of Europe. When we look at Europe, the UK is number one in open source. Germany's behind it and France a long way behind Germany. They're growing faster than the UK is, but we are way ahead. And earlier this year, we hit 3 million GitHub accounts. 
Now, that's 4.5% of the UK population, and that's more than any country in the world. India's got about 9 million, way more than us, but per capita, much less. So we have this really strong grassroots movement in the UK, as well as a lot of leadership. And what I see there, you know, as opposed to the rest of Europe, is that we are seeing startups start to scale in the UK. We've got SNCC, we've got WeaveWorks, Jetstack, you know, a bunch of companies that are coming through. However, historically, we didn't have them. And I think there's a couple of reasons. Uh, one is around skills. So we have great engineers, but we lack some of the other skills around business commercialization. So we are actively working on educating people in that space to bring those skills to the UK. The other thing that we, uh, we're not so good at is risk, right? We don't like failure. Failure is embarrassing if you're British. You know, it's a bit frowned upon. So we need more of that sort of hootspan attitude and risk tolerance that you get, particularly in the Bay Area for our startups to grow. And the third thing we need is funding on decent terms from people who understand open and open source if you want it to grow. Um, and they're not dissimilar to what you need for proprietary companies to scale more. And we are seeing the UK with more unicorns now than the whole of the rest of Europe. You know, they're very proud of that. So, you know, the, the government want us to be the next Silicon Valley. And to do that, they're going to have to get a better understanding of open source because I think everybody here understands it's the future of innovation. So there's that piece about business. Then separately, government. You know, what does government have to understand? Well, I don't know if you've been in the open SSF room today, but they had a lady speaking from the White House who also spoke at Open UK's conference in February. And she's talking again about digitalization. She's talking about the fact that all companies are using software now, which means they're using open source. So they've got to start to understand it. But governments, the public sector, our infrastructure and our national critical infrastructure today is built on open source software. And you've got a lot of the people who are working on that who haven't really understood the, the ways to do it, how to do it you know, the best way possible. So there's a big educational piece there and there's a piece around security. And governments have never been more concerned about bad actors and nation states than they are today. So we see the White House drive that conversation, you know, really on a security level. But that will, I think, evolve into the broader curation conversation that we heard Eric Brewer talking about this morning. You know, making sure that we don't just have good technical hygiene, but good governance as well as security. As we came out of lockdown in the UK, we hosted COP26, and that really focused people in the UK on sustainability. Not sustainability in the way we were talking about it before for engineering, but sustainability and an environmental landscape and the sustainable development goals from the UN. And we actually held our first big event at COP26, which allowed Open UK to really participate in setting this sustainability agenda. And I mentioned earlier, you know, rust as a language uh, uses less energy than many of the others. And I think we will now see an increasing focus on that kind of thing. I mean, we created a blueprint for data centers. We've done one for electric vehicle charging, which look at the landscape and bring together the technologies. And I think there's a natural, um, there's a natural positioning for open source in that. And I, I think we'll see it have a much more elevated status in the next few years in that sustainability agenda. Plus they wanna to learn to collaborate and there's nobody better to teach collaboration than the open source community. What do you think is driving this, you know, when governments are looking at open source, is it the com commercial success of open source mm -hmm. or today? Also these foundations are playing a very big role in creating an event playing field around the project so vendors can contribute. Yeah. So talk about that. I think it's inevitability. So whilst you may not have these massive open source vendors, there is a level. So we have a, a bid out for about half a billion in the UK in healthcare right now. And there is an alternative to the big vendor, a consortium that's being put together. And there are open source players in amongst that consortium. So I think we are seeing challenges. I think also infrastructure is built on open source. The platform economy, the cloud economy is built on open source. And it doesn't really matter how you try and get around it, it just is. You know, the impact that Kubernetes, cloud native, OpenStack, the impact they've all had has shifted the utilization of open source. Now, it's not always well understood that that's what's under there, but I think there's a realization today that your national infrastructure is sitting on top of that. Therefore, we need it to be secure and well maintained and we need it to be well curated. So I think there is a shift in understanding. I think there is still probably more opening up to go on, but even things like um, Log4j, Shell4j, when we saw that vulnerability, the companies that struggled most were the ones that had undisclosed open source. 
right? So this, the work we're doing around the open source ecosystem and the open source governance and things like S-bombs, you know, we used to create things like S-bombs 15 years ago at Canonical. We had to. Our customers wanted to know what was in the, the Ubuntu distribution. That was a standard practice. So this is not new. Being adopted by federal government or required by federal government is new. Um, the, the UK and Europe haven't quite gone down the same route and we're waiting for the UK legislation. I suspect that they will follow suit and I think S1 will be part of it, but it won't be the key focus that it initially was in the US. You know, in 2021 with the executive order, that was the thing. Now we're seeing a more holistic, broader approach coming out of the US that I expect we'll see. And then there's also been a, a great deal of pushback on what the EU has done. I don't really want to be too critical of them, but it, it hasn't gone well for them. Really. Ahmad, thank you so much for taking time out today and, uh, of course, talk about uh, Open UK and also share all those insights about where the industry is heading. Thanks for those, and I would love to have you back on the show. Brilliant. Thank you very much for having me, and I hope to join you again.